that in. So, all right, there we go. Okay, hello everyone and welcome once again. Thank you for joining us for Faithful Futures, exploring the in-person and digital space as church. So when we decided on the name of tonight's Faithful Futures, using the word exploring was very intentional. This space tonight is intended to discover what various individuals and parishes across ECCT have tried on this past year and continue to try on through this transitional time. There have been references to this point in time where we move towards a post-pandemic world needing to see the way that we view church to be considered more of a resurrection more than a resuscitation. So to quote from this wonderful resource from ECF Vital Practices, which I'll be sure to link to at the end of the call, says, to resuscitate someone, or in this case, an institution, is to bring it back to what it once was. It's to revive something and attempt to return it to its former state. Resurrection, however, is different. It acknowledges that after a life-altering experience, things will never be the same. Resurrection, by definition, implies death. Certain things must die in order for new life to take hold. And so, as much as we might hope for it to be so, things will never fully return to the way they once were. We ourselves will never be the same after this year. And like my colleague, Canon Robin Hamil Urban has emphasized to us all time and time again, we have all gone through a collective trauma with COVID. And we had to scramble and rush to figure out this entire past year as we all went without meeting in person for months and months with different regulations coming up every so often. So now let's take this time to give ourselves some grace, reflect upon this past year, what has died, name it, grieve it, and then embrace new models of being church in the days, months, and years to come. Our panelists, much like our Dwelling of the Word referenced, all have unique and different gifts and perspectives to offer us. And the same goes for all of us here today. I want to emphasize this is not intended to be a one size fits all, buy this specific thing and do as I say type of format. Instead, we encourage you to listen to their perspectives while keeping in mind that your own parish or ministry will have its own specific needs. If you haven't already, we encourage you to use this time as a starting point to expand on these conversations and reflections within your own vestries and groups. We will be sharing the same resource that we base tonight's format on with you at the end, so you can continue these full reflective discussions on your own. With all that being said, I'd like to introduce you all to our wonderful panelists for the evening. First up, we have Reverend Margie Baker, who is the Assistant Rector at St. John's in West Hartford. We have Reverend Daryl Burke, priest in charge of Trinity Church Portland. Carolyn Clement, Senior Warden at Trinity Church Tariffville. Reverend Loida Morales, Rector, the Church of the Good Shepherd in Hartford. Reverend Adam Thomas, Rector of St. Mark's Mystic. Reverend Peter Walsh, Rector of St. Mark's New Canaan. And we also have our honorary panelists, Bishop Ian and Bishop Laura, who may not have specific questions directed at them, but we welcome to join in whenever they see fit and have any words of wisdom as well. So to start off, we are going to go into a hybrid worship experience question. Um, and this is open to all panelists, so feel free to chime in anyone who may um, like to offer um, responses. Our first question is, reflect on the ways your church has offered online worship. What has worked and what hasn't? Do we have any volunteers? I'll jump in, Jazri. This is Adam Thomas uh, it's from St. Mark's Mystic. Um, we have been using YouTube Live uh, since the third week of the pandemic. We were on Facebook Live for two weeks and we switched to YouTube. Um, we run our stream using open broadcasting software, OBS, which is a free um, kind of production studio that allows you to stream uh, and uh, create basically produced videos live. Uh, and it works incredibly well for free software. And then we broadcast directly to YouTube Live. We chose YouTube specifically because 
you don't need to have any kind of login or account to watch a YouTube stream. Um, and so we wanted the lowest barrier of entry at all for people to, um, to basically click a button on our website and it goes directly to the stream and there it is. And then it's cataloged on YouTube afterwards. And that, it, that's worked really, really well for us. The combination of YouTube Live, OBS, and a few other ancillary programs that we need to combine everything together. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, also, as a reminder, uh, Stacy just posted a link to one of those um, programs that Adam just um, talked about. And at the end of this call, we will have a document with all the links and everything that gets mentioned on this call. So don't feel like you need to take your own personal notes. We'll make sure to have any links referenced for you guys. So thank you, Adam. Anyone else like to share? Um, I can piggyback on that. Um, we also use YouTube. We um, St. John's West Hartford was already live streaming prior to this. Um, we'd been doing that for about three years, um, which was an absolute blessing in the beginning. And we were very soon shamed by people who had nice cameras because we had a literal security camera, um, which was like fine when it was for just in case you can't make it. Um, so we've recently upgraded that. But just to um, to add to what Adam said, we, we don't do YouTube live, I guess we do live stream, but it's from our YouTube page and I might not know the difference, but we employed constant contact, which was important to send out a message right before the service started. And when we went back to children's formation on Zoom, we sent the email early enough that it also had the Zoom link for those kids. And something that we did um, that has been really helpful is that we reached out to the um, retirement communities where we had a number of members and tried to make sure that we could either get our live stream on their TVs at 1030 on Sunday morning or could at least get laptops or iPads in hands. And so um, that's one of those things moving forward that might be a good way to continue hybrid worship for the people that you know aren't going to be able to get back in the door. Great, thank you, Margie. I, I might jump in here. I'm so interested, uh, Adam, in particular, after we read your piece about what you're doing uh, at St. Mark's in the Canaan, we had a different approach. Uh, we studied the future uh, in 2013 and 2014. It became really clear to us that we needed to put the ministry of the, of the church in everybody's pocket because nobody could come to church. Not nobody, a lot of people weren't coming to church because they were at hockey practice with their kids and we wanted people to participate. So um, we were, have been working with Local Live, which I know some of you have joined in to work with Local Live. Uh, and so we've been streaming for five or six years already, maybe a bit more than that. Um, and we have three cameras that Local Live owns uh, and we essentially rent and we pay them a fee. Uh, we have somebody uh, who is on the call here, Joseph Coolis, uh, who is really our, on, uh, our producer in place. And so we just continued to do what we did. We shut the doors and we just, instead of looking at the people, we looked at the camera uh, and kept going. But our maestro, our music maker had to really learn how to make music and to mix music and to do all of that sort of thing. Uh, and if you use Local Live, you just go on our website and there's a big uh, piece of the marquee that says watch live here now. And, uh, and so for us, it was not a huge transition. Um, there were many, many transitions, but we already had in place all that we needed and felt really lucky and blessed by that. But so much more to learn from so many others uh, of you who have who make this homegrown. So we have been outsourcing uh, and working together with a vendor. Thanks, Peter. I'm curious if anyone has any um, feedback on what hasn't worked or what people don't like about online worship. I, I'm sorry for my laugh, my laughing. So I'll just say that for those of you who do, uh, who are in the building doing the worship, you may think it's going absolutely fabulously well and aren't you incredible and all this. And then if only to find out that the internet is all screwy and all sorts of technical things are happening uh, and that you don't find out until Monday morning when people go, oh man, uh, you were breaking up and you were this and you were that. And so, I, I mean, I think that, um, I, I just think this is a live and learn kind of operation. There's a lot of technology issues that were introduced uh, and that we were always delighted when it worked and thought we really had it. And then the next week there would be some follow-up that we'd have to sort out, so. Um, one thing that um, has been hard, I mean, just basic 
is that we don't have a way to talk to the people in the room. I've been a bit jealous of the churches that used Zoom for their worship um, because there's that interactivity and the ability to see faces. There are definite benefits to live streaming on YouTube, Facebook Live, et cetera, but you miss out on, on the interactivity. One of the challenges is on YouTube specifically is that if people aren't posting in the live chat box, you don't know who's there. You, you can get, by the, at the end of worship, and the, 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 the YouTube live video uh, ends, you'll, you'll be given some statistics about like total views, number of concurrent views at the highest point, and which is the number we kind of record for whatever numbers the parochial report wants at the end of this. Um, and, uh, but, but one of the gifts that we've been given is, is that live chat box has actually become a place where people are putting their prayers. They're, they're saying, hello, they're saying the peace, of the Lord in that chat box. So for the folks that are utilizing the chat box, it's been a really great thing, but then that's probably only 30 or 40% of the people that are actually on the call. So we really don't know who's there. And, and, and so trying to stay in touch with people who might be at worship or might not, but we, but we don't know. I think that's the benefit. I, I met Trinity Terrafil and we do use Zoom and we live stream from Zoom to Facebook Live. Uh, and then live stream from Facebook Live, embed that on the front page of our website. So we have kind of three different places during our live services, uh, our live stream services where people can go. Then we upload it to YouTube later, and we also um, show it on our local TV, sensory community television. Um, it plays throughout the week. So um, we have it available a lot of places, but you know that we we have kept with Zoom because that's the coffee hour opportunity afterwards, before and after, where people can chat and see each other's faces. And you know, we've had some people say like, it's amazing just to see faces. You know, like even when you're at church, you just see the back of everyone's head, you know, <laughs> in worship. So it's kind of fun to see like people reacting and praying. Um, and we do encourage people to put in their prayer requests in the Facebook comments or um, in the Zoom chat. And we um, transfer those to the Zoom chat from Facebook and then pray for those live and that sort of thing. So um, we've tried to you know, be as interactive as we can. And now we've just started back indoors um, a few weeks ago. So we're figuring that all out. Like I said, we took out the big lights. Um, so it's a little darker than it was, you know, two weeks ago, and uh, we're still trying to figure it all out. And that's the the name of this game is is, you know, listen and learn, test and learn. If it's not working, try something different. Uh, Man Emmanuel Church in Killingworth, which is part of the Cluster Ministry Network. Um, oh, Deb, one second, Deb. We're gonna have we're gonna have a time for questions. I apologize for not running through that agenda. We'll get to that in just a bit. First, we're just having some premeditated questions, which is going to lead me to my next question for Loida. Um, Reverend Loida, are you on the call? I believe I saw your name here. I apologize for the lateness. Oh, no, not at all. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I have a question for you, Loida. What new collaboration efforts emerged during the pandemic for you? Uh, well, I have to thank that um, the Reverend Peter Bushnell from Grace Church in Stafford Spring. Uh, he did give me a call uh, precisely when we were before the governor's uh, executive order to be shut in, inviting me for, along with uh, Steve Ling from Holy Trinity Enfield. I'm with Good Shepherd in Hartford. Uh, so he invited me to start a Zoom Sunday morning prayer. Um, in regards to me, Zoom, I would use it just like right now for meetings, but to use it for the service, uh, I just didn't know much. But anyway, uh, we went together and we started at Holy Trinity Enfield. Uh, Father Peter Wuschnell was the one with his computer, uh, just a, a camera, and we started doing our uh, services together. Uh, we, Father Peter Wuschnell would have the, the Sunday morning prayer all prepared. We would sit in front of the uh, um, altar 
uh, the choir, the three of us with masks, distancing, just checking, and at times it worked, but at other times we tried to rotate churches. For example, when we came to the Church of the Good Shepherd, the Wi-Fi simply did not allow us to connect with anybody. So it was like panic. Okay, what do we do? And uh, we just realized that we needed to install Wi-Fi uh, in our church, uh, Good Shepherd, at least Holy Trinity Enfield and Grace Church Stafford Spring did have Wi-Fi. Maybe it was not, um, uh, I don't know, a strong signal. And also depending if we had the computer on, if someone else had their cell phone, depending how many other people were connected, we either did have a clear image or we didn't. So then we had problems in regards to the sound. Sometimes our voices were not heard. So it was just, you know, um, for three people that didn't know that much on Zoom of technology, well, at least Peter Bushnell could imagine, and then some of the musicians, the organists, um, younger people were helping us to find ways to then present a better um, Zoom image, online image for everybody, uh, at least, you know, for our parishioners. But um, it was really a trial and error and there were times when Zoom itself would collapse because there were too many people uh, trying to get into the signal. But in another sense, uh, for example, one of the things that it allowed us to do, we not only did the Sunday services, we also did ministries through the week uh, we had a uh, Bible study, we have a book study, we had a sacrificial love and social justice ministry all provided via Zoom. And those were a bit uh, smaller groups, but it allowed us to uh, talk each other, present. And uh, so that worked quite well in the sense with Zoom. Um, Zoom also allowed us to connect with uh, people from outside our churches of the Episcopal Church. We have one example with Father Peter Bushnell's sister. Um, she is a member of a group of non-denominational missionaries. She lives in Puebla, Mexico, and she would join us in our service. And then she had another connection with another missionary who would contact us through Zoom and he lived in India. So there we have an international connection through Zoom. Through Facebook group, I have, for example, family members that would also connect with a service. Usually with our 1215 service in the Church of the Good Shepherd, we had Spanish speakers and what they are known to use is Facebook. So we had the Facebook group quite a long time within our Facebook page of the Good Shepherd. So with them, we continued using the Facebook group. Uh, but one of the things that truly, the problems I had with Facebook group was I was using my cell phone. So it was the sound. Sometimes people either the sound it was like too far off so that they couldn't really uh, understand what I was saying. But at the end, you know, you try to buy um, items, microphones, and again, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not work. But at least with the presentations that we have done um, so far, I think, you know, for what happened in regards to the pandemic, at least we were able to remain afloat, I would say. Yes. Right, Lara. So in terms of this collaboration effort, 
do you have plans to retain it in some form moving forward when we think about post COVID? And if so, how is that gonna look the same? Are there things that you guys are thinking of changing? Are you having this discussion with them in Stafford Springs? Uh, at this time, we, uh, a few months ago, we decided at least Good Shepherd, the parishioners decided to start doing our service ourselves. We were doing it outdoors. Now we're doing it indoors. Um, Holy Trinity and Stafford Spring, I think they're each on their own, but they continue, not just uh, the whether outdoor or indoors, they continue with Zoom. For the Good Shepherd, uh, with the help of our music director and another member of the musicians who are very technology knowledgeable, they installed cameras so that at least through Zoom, depending on the voice, each camera would focus and Zoom would provide spotlight. You know, if it was the reader, you would see the reader. So it's a better quality in regards of what we're providing to our viewers. So we're doing both things, um, in-person worship. And at the same time, we're continuing with Zoom because the homebound, you know, they connected with us throughout the pandemic and so that they can also continue connecting with us through worship. We continue doing our weekday, especially the, our ministry, the Sacrificial Love and Social Justice Ministry. For example, even uh, yesterday, we had a presentation with retired Bishop Suffragan James Curry in regards to his ministry of uh, swords to plowshares via Zoom with a group from the different churches. So we do continue doing a Zoom and Facebook group for the Hispanics in Good Shepherd. So we do continue with that technology. Yes. Great, thank you, Loida. Um, before we continue, I can see two, two items here that we ourselves at the Commons are you know, already discussing about updating. We, our Wi-Fi and internet in general, we're talking about updating just to support, you know, this extra weight um, on the internet. And then we also have updated our um, our camera system for our uh, our staff meetings. So right now we just tried on hybrid staff, where some staff is starting at the Commons and some is still home. Um, so similar to what Lloyd has said, we're using um, a camera. It's an OWL product. Maybe Stacey, you can find the website just for people to kind of see what kind of products are out there where it, it's really amazing what they have nowadays um, where it can just focus and zoom in on the person that's speaking and gives pretty much a 360 view of everybody that's in the room. So if that's something that might interest you or uh, meet your needs, there are products like that out there. Okay, so next up we have Adam and he's gonna talk a little bit about the changing community for him at St. Mark's Mystic. Adam, many parishes have experienced virtual newcomers, which we've heard from everybody so far pretty much. Can you tell us a little bit of what this looked like for you specifically? Sure, uh, well, besides my parents joining from uh, New Bern, North Carolina every week for the last year, um, we've had uh, quite a few folks um, who are uh, attending our online services from across the country, they tend to be folks that are related to members of our church um, who, you know, talk to their uh, parents who are senior citizens who, who didn't have an ability to go to church and they kind of talk them through how to, how to get onto our services. And so we actually have um, our, when I look at the numbers for the, the live stream I mentioned earlier about um, the uh, concurrent views being the number that we look at. And so before the pandemic, our average Sunday attendance was about 130 people. Um, during the pandemic, we would, be, we would be hitting about 80 to 85 concurrent views on YouTube. And I would think about like a multiplier um, that every view, every concurrent view is probably more than one person because some of them will be one person, some of them will be two, some will be three or four. And so I started thinking to myself that the multiplier here is probably between 1.5 and 2 
people per view. And so I started to think, wow, our average Sunday attendance has gone from 130 to 160 or 170, um, which is kind of crazy. And it's because we've been getting uh, folks who are related to the church, but not, not, but don't live here. And as we look forward to um, having in-person services again, which we've started a few weeks ago, and we're going back to our two services, eight o'clock and 10 o'clock this coming Sunday, and we've just moved all the live stream equipment. So it's not four feet away from my face anymore. Um, uh, we're having to, you know, figure out what that hybrid really is going to look like. And, um, I'm, I'm looking at it from two, two different perspectives. One of them is the logistical and one of them is theological. And there's a passage of scripture that's really been guiding me in, um, the, the theological reflection on how to do hybrid worship. And that's the uh, middle part of John chapter four, which is Jesus's conversation with the, the woman at the well. Um, after they have their whole conversation about living water, um, she recognizes that Jesus is a prophet and she asks Jesus the hot button question of the day, which is where should we worship? Do we worship on Mount Gerizim in Samaria where, where her culture worshiped or do we worship at the temple in Jerusalem? And um, Jesus says something really interesting to her. He says, um, uh, he says, uh, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And then later he says, um, uh, the hour is coming is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. That passage has really been, been with me this past year as I think about hybrid worship, because when we're stuck on either Mount Gerizim or, Jeru or, or the temple in Jerusalem, we don't recognize the opportunities we have to worship God in spirit and truth. And if, if we, but if we focus on worshiping God in spirit and truth, we recognize that we can, um, that our worship can be so much more expansive than what happens in a building one hour a week. Um, so from a theological standpoint, I'm looking at that hybrid worship as one of the ways we expand beyond Mount Gerizim in Jerusalem. Um, and from a logistical standpoint, as we move back into more in-person worship, what I'm really trying to do is make sure that those people who are watching online don't feel like second class class citizens in the church. Um, that even though the cameras aren't as close as they used to be, uh, because we're trying not to have them, you know, as intrusive as they, they were, um, I'm still trying to make sure that those people feel like they are there with us, that they are participating, um, not in the same way, but still participating fully. Um, and that includes having Zoom fellowship, that includes having the opportunity when we have our adult forum to have people on Zoom or in the building. We have a 70 inch flat screen in our undercroft, which we can put Zoom on uh, so that we have the opportunity to have people in the building and on Zoom. We're going to do that with our vestry meeting in a couple of weeks to test it out. Um, so we're really trying to make to really live into that hybrid space so that we're not seeing um, the pandemic as something that we're now past and we can go back to normal but that we're normalizing the hybridity of, of having people online or in person because a lot of those new people, I hope will stick around. And even though they don't live here. So that's, those, those are the, those are my initial thoughts on, on what we're doing with, uh, with those folks. Thank you, Adam. So you, you kind of went into how you're continuing to engage those people from going from, Completely in person, it sounded like. Were you hybrid before COVID or were you? No, not zero. Okay. Not, not at all. Right. Not at all. No, so we from started. In person. Yep. 100% in person to 100% online. And now we're and doing. Now navigating both. Yeah. Yep. And our, so we've, been, we've been moving slowly into back into in person over the last month. Mm -hmm. Adding, I've been telling people that we're adding one thing at a time. Um, and uh, when we have more people in church than we have online, we, we're sort of flipping a switch where, where we now are moving more right now, this, this coming Sunday is the one where is the Sunday where we're flipping that switch to having the cameras in different places and um, trying to, and we'll, we'll, it'll take us a few weeks to figure out mm -hmm. really what that's going to look like for folks online versus folks in person. And thankfully folks have been pretty patient and flexible overall. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to reconnecting with you after a couple of weeks and seeing how this is going for you so far. Thanks, Adam. So next, um, I'd like to direct this question at Carolyn. Um, we're talking about digital creativity and ministry now. 
So Carolyn, can you tell us a little bit about what some ways, what are some ways that online creativity has been embraced during this time that you've seen or experienced? Sure, there has just been this tremendous outpouring of innovation and creativity in the church. I've been so inspired by it. And um, it's just, you know, we talk about being transformed, not conformed, you know, there's just been this total transformation for all of us most of us were like adding um, digital church as an afterthought or maybe not doing it at all. And we like in a week <laughs> for many of us became a completely digital worshiping community. So just so inspiring to see and I've loved being a part of it. Um, you know, a lot of that is like the, 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 um, the gift of um, constrictions. So, that brings out innovation, obviously. Like if you tell your kid, go build a car, they're gonna have no idea what you're talking about. If you say, take the items in the recycling bin and build a car with that, all of a sudden their minds are gonna explode and they're gonna be able to use tools and ideas in all new ways. So that's sort of where we were. We, we were like put into this little box, like, okay, go build a worshiping community. And you got Zoom that you never heard of and you have somebody's cell phone and you know, let's find free tools for making music. And it's just been incredible. So I've been totally inspired by it. And I've loved um, peeking in on other people's services on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so some of the examples from our church, I think came from um, some of the following areas. Uh, first of all, identifying and meeting the needs of the parish. Uh, for example, really quickly, remember March and April and how devastated everyone was and clinically depressed and horrified and lonely and isolated. And so we knew we needed to connect. We knew we needed to pray. And so we um, quick got a Zoom account and we started doing the daily office, morning prayer, noontime prayer, Compline. And we um, you know, got uh, volunteers to figure out how to use the account and how to lead it. We got some people trained through the, the ECTT workshops and um, Boy, we did those for about a month. We did three a day and we had a pretty good size number of people coming because we were all in crisis. And we had a lot of people inviting others from the community or friends, people we have never seen and maybe never will see again, but they were stopping in because they needed prayer and they needed community. So as time went on and we're like, oh, I guess I'm gonna be in my house for a while. I've got it figured out. You know, we had fewer people coming to the noontime prayer. So we dropped that one. And, you know, now we don't do six days a week of Compline. We do Monday through Thursday. And we still do morning prayer Monday through Saturday. So that may change as well. I don't know. Um, what we have heard is from folks who are homebound are, please never leave us again. Because these are names that we've read about in the newsletter for years and now you are our friends and that's really true it's been incredible i mean i have like a close friend who's um a 94 year old woman who i'd never met until a uh, zoom morning prayer about a year ago and she texts me like videos on youtube and you know we're friends that's how it works so identifying and meeting the needs and changing as required the second is like creating new ways for ministry to happen so we had things like song a day, you know, for church musicians, pandemic has been really horrific. Any church musicians in the crowd, you want to respond to that in the chat? It's been really, really hard to not use that ministry and not be able to gather together and sing. But we figured out band lab. Um, we had one of our parishioners who started a song a day project for Advent. So every day in Advent, someone from our church posted a song and some of them were like, da, 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 you know, selfie singing a cappella. Some were like, you know, put it on a tripod or playing a piano, a song on the piano or the flute or whatever. Um, but every day we had a song, a little history about the song, why they chose it. And it was such a great way for our church ministers to use their gifts to uh, engage the community and, um, you know, bring worship on our Facebook group. So that was lovely. Um, we've also, of course, like many of you have done Bible studies, Lenten program on Zoom. Um, another way is through collaboration, which we've talked about a little bit. Uh, we did a Lessons and Carols collaboration with um, St. Paul's Huntington and St. Thomas Bethel. And we joined our choirs 
we did a great Lessons and Carols. We joined with them again and did um, our children's pageant. And that was beautiful. And then we also collaborated with our, again, our local TV station who had broadcast our last two years of Lessons and Carols. And we um, got permission from them to do watch parties on Facebook Live of 2018 and 2019. And we all gathered online and watched those and chatted and sang along and all that sort of thing. So just collaborating. And then the, the last one I'll talk about is really looking at the community and figuring out how we can serve them in new ways. So, you know, food insecurity has been an issue, obviously. So we uh, started this fill the truck um, program where we, um, people come to the parking lot and you get to see people, even though you're in your masks and you're distanced and we're, you're working wow. together to serve the needs in the community. Uh, we've been doing a selfies with Santa the last couple of years for the neighborhood kids. We, we couldn't bring them into the building this year, but we got the fire station to um, be the lead car in our parade and took Santa up and down every street in our town honking and waving with our priest, you know, tossing candy canes out the window and, um, you know, live streaming some of it onto Facebook. So again, it's just like this, the, you have these strictures. So what can we do? How can we uh, think outside of that box or inside of that box or however, and um, identify, meet needs, pivot as needed, allow new ways of doing ministry and uh, collaborate with whoever's willing to collaborate with you to, uh, to move things forward. Thanks, Caroline. And when you talk about collaboration specifically in your parish, can you tell us um, who's primarily been responsible for the online ministry? And do you think it's a sustainable model or is this something that you need to think about staffing or a volunteer team as we start moving forward? Yeah, I'd say we ha we've had a team of about five or six people that have been predominantly responsible for it. And, um, you know, I think that's the case in crises is that usually there isn't a big bunch of people that picks everything up and moves it forward. It's usually a pretty small team that works together and gets it done. Um, we've, you know, I, I is it sustainable? I don't know. It's what we have for now. When it's not, we'll do something different. Um, but it's it's working so far. Great, thank you, Carol. And there we have like you know our our priest is obviously involved, and then um, we have one staff person that's pretty involved. She um, runs the Zoom uh, live worship, but she's working with someone else in our church who is learning that that skill so that she can take that on or alternate. Okay, great, thank you. That's helpful. All right, Margie, we're going to pivot over to children's formation and youth ministry. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about how children's formation look like for you during this time? Okay, um, what um, children's formation looked like a whole lot of different things, depending on the day, the season, and where we were in the pandemic, which I'm guessing resonates with what everything else in church and life looked like. Um, so big picture, I was in the middle of confirmation class when this happened. So the first thing that we did was we moved our confirmation class to Zoom Sunday school. Um, and so that, that happened early. And because it was confirmation class that we needed to finish, I couldn't do anything with my younger kids yet. Um, I immediately started doing a children, youth, and families newsletter every week that had resources, um, sometimes as simple as coloring pages that had to do with the lectionary, or here's an article I read, or here's a video about anti-racism in your kid. <laughs> um, so we sent those out and um, just to make sure that parents were involved. Once confirmation class ended, um, Palm Sunday of 2020, which feels like a long time ago, um, we switched over to doing a one-room schoolhouse Zoom Sunday school. Um, I made it up as I went, um, and I understand that I'm privileged to be able to do that. I was a public school educator and curriculum creator and also online teacher um, before I went to seminary, so that made it a little bit easier for me. Um, and, and also this is my job. So that, that gave me the time and the bandwidth. Um, what I will say worked really well. We hit our groove for Sunday school in the fall. 
Um, so like this year, we started looking at the saints. Um, we used the forward movement free, um, oh, celebrating the saints is I believe what it's called. We used that as our, um, as our template because my kids love saints, like love them. Last year, pre-pandemic, we did a big all saints fair and kids prepared and researched their saints and, you know, came dressed as their saints and the high schoolers helped the kids find their saint day based on like a database, you know, on their birthday. Um, so this year we couldn't do that, but we spent the fall semester looking at different saints and we had an all saints parade masked socially distanced in the rain on all saints Sunday. Um, because it was the right thing to do. And there are hilarious videos of kids with like music makers and masks and umbrellas um, walking around our church. Um, but they loved it. And one of the things that we do no matter what for Zoom Sunday School is feature art, feature mostly Wikimedia Commons so that it's free. It's often old white people painted by old white people, um, but we do try to do a good job of getting other images as well. Um, we've switched to Bible stories for the spring. I've used illustrated ministry because illustrated ministry's theology is, is pretty solid. It's, um, and because they have great coloring options and because the way they tell the stories of our faith is um, appropriate for a kindergartner, but chunky enough for a fifth grader so that there's something to jump into. Um, our kids have loved that. It's a small but mighty group. Um, in terms of children and families, though, other things that we've tried, um, the youth group did not like Zoom. That did not work for us. We, we tried it for a little bit, and it was not fun. Um, they love doing service projects, and they love doing them outside, even if the weather is really, really bad. <laughs> um, some days it was very cold. Some days we had to be in the narrow portico because it was misting. Um, so we, we tried to be outside with them whenever possible. We make sandwiches for loaves and fishes is very popular activity. Um, they stuffed the bags for our advent in a bag. We tried to give take homes when possible. Advent in a bag is one example. Um, and we had a take home screen free vacation Bible school in 2020, um, where you're not having to look at anything. Let's just explore outside with your own family. Um, and then this year for the EYC, this spring, we did the dismantling racism curriculum outside in our cloister garden. Um, the biggest challenge for that is that it's video heavy, which is wonderful. And our cloister garden, you know, is outside. So that was a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. And if I were to do it again, I would like to not have a pandemic, please, um, so that I can be inside. That would, that would be my preference. Um, but we had sixth grade through 12th grade doing dismantling racism, you know, masked, socially distant. And I had parents of fifth graders asking if their kids could participate. And of course, the answer was yes. If, if kids are wanting to have those conversations, we need to let them. It is a curriculum out of the Diocese of Atlanta in collaboration with the Absalom Jones Center. Um, you need to be trained on it. You literally cannot buy the materials until you're trained, and that's important. They have new training dates up. It's wonderful, and if you want to talk to me about that offline, I'd love to chat. Um, I would also love to do it as a retreat once the pandemic is over, because that's really the best way for it. So if any churches would like to collaborate on that and maybe do a retreat at Camp Washington, talk to me because that would be a really good way to do this um, and one of the other great things about it is that it is it's it works well at a church where you have where all you have are white people like <laughs> that's okay that's what our youth group was um those those are the kids who showed up and it um it does a really good job of highlighting voices that need to be heard without making for instance the one kid of color in the room be the spokesperson <laughs> for everything that needs to be said so I, i'm sorry i'm rambling about that but i'm really a big fan of it um and then finally things that worked really well. We did a virtual Christmas pageant and it was a hoot. Um, it was an absolute hoot to the point where I want to see if there's ways to do other virtual Bible stories. I don't ever want to have the pageant be virtual again, but I could see this as a gift to the community or even doing a movie premiere kind of thing where the rest of the parish gets to sit in the parish hall and see what the kids have made. Um, we did virtual Youth Sunday last year with three senior preachers with 
kid written prayers of the people, et cetera. We did in person this year, which was amazing. Uh, masked, socially distant, but the K-5 class wrote the Sunday school, uh, wrote the prayers of the people, and, um, and we had seven different readers and a senior preacher, um, which is all to say that the kids are still there. Um, if you had kids before, they're probably still there. They're hanging out. They still have the big questions. And I think you'll be able to, you'll be able to pick them back up if you haven't already. Fantastic. Thank you, Margie, for going through those pieces of what is continuing on as well. So, okay, for our final topic, before we open up the floor for questions, we are going to be talking about in-person gatherings. So we have Reverend Daryl and Reverend Peter here to give different perspectives um, in terms of being quarter time and full time and where things are similar and where things may be different. So um, Daryl, if you are on the call, could I have you go first in terms of giving your perspective and as to how church is looking for you or how you guys are discussing church will look for you as you regather in person. Can you let us know about where you are in that status and how that looks for you guys? I'm gonna ask you to unmute Daryl, you might've been muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, uh, perfect. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, I'm in my car. <laughs> but we, <laughs> we've 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 started um, the process of of moving indoors. So in person ha has been what they they wanted since last year. I, I've I only started in September, so they have been meeting indoors, and the weather was still nice. So we moved outdoors. When, when I came to them. And uh, once winter came, we, we did outdoor drive-in services, which was in person of, of a sort. So they, they'd come in and they'd be in their cars and they could pick up the service on a radio station. And, and that went extremely well. We used to get a fairly good turnout because people didn't have to worry about getting dressed up for church. You come as you, you are, you don't have to get out your car, you don't have to interact with anyone, it was safe. And we used to get a fairly good turnout for that. And um, now as we move back in indoors, there's still some reluctance. We do have an air exchange system, which makes it easier because we, we've got that constant flow of, of fresh air coming in. That was installed during the pandemic. So the, 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 the safety precautions aren't as, as worrisome. Plus, we have a membership where most of them are over 65 and have been vaccinated. So we get a, a fairly good turnout, but they're a very Eucharist-centered congregation. And, and that's what they, they want. They want the Eucharist. And they're not happy with spiritual Eucharist. They're not happy with uh, the one kind Eucharist there that we've tried the little cups and and that that seems to appease the majority of them but that's something with which I'm not happy so we haven't reached that that happy medium as of this point um, we we've been able to do other things as well it's a very um because they were without a priest for so long, about a year or more, they, they were a very um, lay, heavy church, a lay, lay led church, the church, the services, they were doing their own services, and they're, they're fairly good at that. The only problem is that there are a group of about seven people who, who do all of that, and they haven't made room for, for other people to, to join in. But well, they, and given the, the pandemic, it, it's hard to get other people to join in because you, you don't see people. Mm -hmm. So what, they, other, what they've, they've done that, we've tried to do other things that um, were done so that we, we could involve more people and could involve the community for um, <coughs> good 
for Ash Wednesday, we did an outdoor service where we 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 burned palms and then used those to 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 sort of put the crosses on ourselves. Um, and then for Good Friday, we did a stations of the cross on the grass outside of the church on the on the area we would usually use for outdoor services and had the stations of the cross and a, a statement by by various members of the congregation for each and as well as a recorded statement <laughs> so they could follow along on on, um, on headphones from a from the video a video headphone sort of thing and that was very positive it was so inviting that we left it up for probably another two weeks to invite members from the community to to add their prayers to to these prayer stands these tomato i guess stands garden stands that they had placed the um stations with cross on and then had people place their prayers on those as well and that seemed to work extremely well and it really invited was a way of inviting outsiders from the community to join us in that effort we we got a good number to to join us in that um they, they were very i almost want to say anti-covid they they didn't want to restrict their behaviors or anything because of COVID, that that shouldn't stop them from from being able to come into the church. And uh, that was a, a battle for a couple of months until I, it was clear that I'm not risking my life coming into the church, <laughs> that um, there are other ways. And that's where we were able to do the outdoor services until it got too cold and then the drive-in services, which which were really kind of popular and got people. We additionally had um, a Zoom service each week with, I think it was Trinity Church in Collinsville, where um, members of, of both congregations did a, a Zoom service together. That has ended as of about two weeks ago. Okay. So I'm hearing the same themes of collaboration. We've heard some drive-in worship that's been happening, outdoor worship. Yeah. Peter, can you tell us a little bit about how this regathering process has looked for you and your parish? Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll try to be brief so that we have time for questions. Uh, so we, like the rest of all of you, closed our doors on the second Sunday of Lent uh, back in 2020. But on July 4th of last year, uh, that weekend we had outdoors, we began outdoor services uh, and we have continued with those outdoor services at nine o'clock every Sunday morning all through the winter. Uh, we, have a, we have a hearty crew uh, and they love it. We have a big congregation in certain days in what we call the outdoor cathedral. So we have actually been together. We had all protocols for outdoor worship uh, at the time. Uh, on the fifth Sunday of Easter, we had a, we had a uh, a kind of soft opening where we brought people inside, mass, social distance, sign up, all of that sort of thing. Uh, some folks came in, we skipped Palm Sunday for a few different reasons. Uh, and then on Easter, we regathered for three services uh, because social distancing demanded that we have a bunch of services so people could be spaced out, not just when the preacher was preaching, uh, they could be spaced out. And then we had the stream as usual and we had an outdoor service later at four o'clock. So. Uh, we were rolling along with that, and then about three weeks ago, we had a regathering committee at Thursday morning at nine o'clock. We made a bunch of plans for what we were going to do with outside groups, and then that afternoon, the, the governor dropped on the, uh, or the CDC dropped, it's not the governor, the CDC dropped out that vaccinated people could return to normal activities, uh, and we pivoted immediately, uh, and in that immediate pivot, we wanted to create uh, something for everybody. So the nine o'clock outdoor service for those who are not ready uh, and the 10 o'clock stream for those who are used to that. And then on in-person, uh, we switched to uh, all what we call almost normal. And so for us, what we have been doing for the last, I believe it's three weeks uh, or two weeks coming on three, uh, we have no masks uh, indoors for those who are vaccinated. 
We kindly ask that those who are not vaccinated to please wear masks. Uh, there is no longer any social distancing uh, in our pews. And if there's no social distancing, there's no need for a sign up. Uh, we have gone whole hog here. We have gone in and we do have congregational singing, but we do not have the common cup. Uh, there was uh, a great push from the people of our parish that they wanted something for their kids. They wanted to return to something as normal as possible. Uh, on the first Sunday, we, we opened up uh, very quickly our nursery uh, and nobody showed up uh, the first Sunday, but by the second Sunday that we were open, uh, people uh, not only came to the nursery, but we opened it up for kids, uh, activities for kids outside third grade and younger. Uh, there has been a great delight for people to return to, to being in the building and to almost normal. Uh, we, were, we were very early on on closing our doors and uh, we were very, very safe. But when the pivot came, we, when the return to normal came, uh, we chose to pivot into it. Uh, when we were studying the future back in 2013 and 2014, as I mentioned earlier, we worked with the Futurist uh, and uh, from the Institute of the Future in Palo Alto, California. And one of the things I remember him saying was, uh, on all new ideas, there are, there, are, there are fast adopters and there are slow adopters and there is everybody in between. Uh, we chose to be a fast adopter to the new the new normal guidelines uh, because we had knew that there was a group of people in our parish uh, who were chafed with us uh, that uh, we were, were, in their opinion, slow to open our doors. And so we went in for that. Uh, there has been no pushback, no noise, uh, and everybody in our community is finding their place. Uh, there's a lot to be said about uh, what will come and how this will emerge. There's no kind of playbook. We're making it up as we go. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. So with that, we will open the floor to um, questions from our audience. Feel free to raise your Zoom hand if you would have any questions for any of our panelists. If there aren't, as we wait for some, I'll toss one back over to you, uh, Peter. I'm wondering, um, are there any traditions that you guys are realizing as you are regathering in person that simply can't or happen anymore? Like, how are you navigating situations in terms of passing collection plates, touching at the piece, food at coffee hour, common cup? How, how, how are you navigating those areas? Uh, you know, kind of, uh, you don't have to tackle them all, but I'm not going to tackle them all. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there, if you read the CDC stuff, there seems like there's inconsistencies all over the place, right? And we have our own batch of inconsistencies, uh, which is to say we have not returned to the common cup. Uh, so only the celebrant drinks from the comic cup. I know our, our right reverends do not do that. Uh, as a show of solidarity, uh, we do. The, the celebrant in our, in our case does drink from, drink from the cup, but no one else does. Uh, we have a collection plate at the back when people walk in. We haven't passed the collection plate. And yet, uh, you know, some people do uh, embrace it to peace. But for the most part, we've trained our people for 14 months to stay away from each other, right? And even to stay away from church. That's what the local congregational minister says. And a lot of our people really learned the training, right? And so uh, we have some people that they walk in the building, they can't really want to hug every person. And other people are like, I'm here, but don't touch me. Okay, dude. Uh, so uh, again, people are all over the place. And I think that we are just going to play it as it unfolds. We don't have any game plan uh, as we work our way forward week by week. We'll just keep revisiting it. All right. Do any other panelists have um, would like to respond to that? Again, the question was: Are there any traditions um, that you're not doing, or how? In terms, of what are you? How are you navigating these situations when it comes to passing collection plates, touching at the piece, food at coffee hour, congregational singing? Um, this one. Uh... And I think that it's going to be something that changes for the future is that prior to the pandemic, we had children's chapel and we've had kids in worship, you know, since late March, I guess. And they do great because um, we couldn't do children's chapel with the pandemic. They have children's bulletins that are thematic and they pay attention and they're engaged. And so we think moving forward that that's not a need for us. We already did a very short one, um, but even that, like we'll have the nursery open in the fall and otherwise all children will stay in worship. And so far it's going great. We, one thing that we've done is um, our 
children's program would always be at our 945, you know, our main service. But what we heard from parents who I guess were just going along with it because that's what we had. But they said, wow, we wish it could be earlier. Like we put our kids on the bus at 730. And so by 945, they're already like moved on to the rest of their day. So we have moved that to our um, 830 outdoor service so that we can provide a children's program outdoors during that service. And, you know, we might leave it there or I don't know what we're going to do. We have, we're figuring it out as we go along, but um, that seems to work out for a, a lot of our parents to have that at the earlier service. Interesting. Thank you, Caroline. We have a question in the chat. Um, Gwen Pond is asking, wondering status of individual churches on reintroducing hymnals and prayer books. Who our panelists have to say for that? We put ours back in the pew on Tuesday, um, but we're not really going to use them because we're still not doing congregational singing and almost the entire service is in the program. So mostly put them back so that when people come to the church, they see them. Um, but we're not using them just yet. We know that COVID isn't spread uh, by touching prayer books. So it made a lot of sense not to leave them out of the, out of the building. Thanks, I would say, you know, uh, like you, Adam, I mean, we have our prayer books and hymnals in the pews and we also print it in part so that the people who are streaming at home who don't have a book or may not have a book can have access uh, if they would like to download the bulletin. But I noticed that some people can't wait to pick up the prayer book and they can't wait to pick up the hymnal. The words are there, but man, they're, you know, they're all, I'm going to hymn 680 because I, because I can't. Yeah. I, so. That actually reminds me of something. One thing that we're doing right now is redesigning our bulletin. Um, so that it's agnostic as to printing it at home or, or, or having the one at, at the building. We didn't want to have to create two bulletins, one to be printed at home for live stream people and one to be printed at the, at the church. And we used to use legal size paper, which people don't have at home. Uh, so we're redesigning it as a trifold. Um, and then the trifold can be printed on six pieces of paper at home. Um, so so for our outdoor, we've done a lot of outdoor services. Like it's, sometimes it's been 28 degrees and we've just been bundled up in our stadium blankets in the parking lot, you know, worshiping. But we um, did away with the bulletin for that, although we still created a bulletin online for our main online service. And, you know, everyone mostly brought their own prayer books or I had learned from the Wednesday call the, the concept of checking out a prayer book and keeping it. And so, you know, a lot of people took prayer books home and have just kind of kept them there and brought them back and forth. Um, I would love to kind of do away with the bulletin. I feel like that's a lot of work and uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. So we'll see. Um, you know, we've had a year of all in-persons, every in-person service we did had no bulletin and everyone managed to do fine. So um, I, I don't know what we're gonna do. I'm I'm not in charge of making that decision, but um, I'd love to get rid of the bulletin, sort of. And here <laughs> I'll jump in because you know, uh, Carolyn, I can't resist myself on that. I think having the ability and knowledge and facility and relationship with the Book of Common Prayer is a wonderful thing for Christians of all kinds, but particularly those in the Anglican way of following Jesus to inhabit. That's a long way of saying, I think printing, spending time putting together individual uh, worship bulletins, whether on paper or online is an incredible amount waste, well, an incredible amount of time, energy, and expense, never mind environmental impact for printing all those bulletins on paper. Um, I appreciate the argument that it's much more user friendly um, if you have a single bulletin already produced. Having said that, you can also be very user friendly by helping people to find their place in the prayer book, either in leading worship or once we reduce the six foot perimeter, actually leaning over and helping a stranger 
find their way in worship is a wonderful act of hospitality. So thank you. I couldn't resist, Carolyn. You gave me the opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, the other thing in our church, we have a screen. So like stuff is printed on the screen. And um, when we're doing online worship, of course, everything is, is um, all the text is printed on there too. So uh. And this again, this all falls under the what works, what didn't work, what are we thinking about bringing forward with us that, you know, worked in the digital landscape and might be worthwhile reflecting and talking, you know, with our vestry and parishes or who are, whoever are these decision makers about, is it worth bringing this piece of this forward, even if we are going in person, is it worth investing in a, um, you know, a screen or whatever it is that you might um, use to incorporate people who are viewing digitally as well as in person. So these are all questions that we encourage you all to reflect on and have open and honest conversations with. There might, there might not be a immediate yes or no. It's, it's worth discussing and wondering about. Um, so with that, I will be posting in the chat um, this, this document, again, like I said, that our questions were focused on and we encourage you to look at, you don't have to use this one per se, but it's a great um, conversation starter just to put it out there. What have we done first of all? Let's sit and breathe and realize everything we've done and accomplished this past year and then take those next steps. What has worked? What hasn't? What do we like? What don't we like? What can we bring forward? And what do we leave behind? So. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I want to thank our panelists. Um, I think we are, I think you guys did so good. There's not even any questions left for you. So with that um, being said, I'd like to pass it on over to Bishop Laura to um, start our uh, learnings, relearnings and where people have seen God. Thanks, Jasri. Thank you, everyone. This was so fun. I learned so much and it was so fun to to hear from hear from some practitioners and to um, think about exploring new things. So um, just thank you all for your courage and your creativity, as well as your faithfulness as we live into this, um, this new opportunity that we have now. One of the questions we like to end our meetings with in the Episcopal Church in Connecticut is, we used to call it appreciations, regrets, and or learnings. Um, but sometimes now what we like to ask is, where did God show up for you tonight? Um, so I'm going to invite you to put in the chat um, some reflections on maybe what you learned or what an appreciation or a regret. Um, but I also want to invite you to share with us um, in this kind of prayerful time with the chat, where did God show up for you tonight? Um, so we'll take some time and just enjoy the chat and reflect on reflect on what what's our takeaway for this evening. Where did God show up?
I want to reiterate what Ellendale just typed. God shows up for us in the chat every time we gather. I just so love, I just so love dwelling in the chat and hearing, getting so many more voices in the room. Um, so I want to thank everyone tonight, and particularly Jazri, thank you. We are so blessed to have you as our canon for, for mission communication. We are just, we are just blessings abound. So thank you so much for tonight and for all things. Why don't we close our time? Yeah, Ian's doing. Ian's doing the wave your. Hand. We're gonna wave our hands and do that. <laughs> Superstar. Um, why don't we end with the Lord's prayer and I'll offer a blessing. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you this night and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Jazri. Thank, Thank you, Jazri. everyone. Thank, Thank you to our panel. wonderful panelists. Amen. Amen. The panelists were terrific. And thank you. They need to add an amen emoji. Amen. Oh, they amen. do need to add an amen emoji. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you.